The Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, bless your hearts and welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to do a special tonight. Jacob and Esau. Inasmuch as uh, Premier Gorbachev is in this nation and the events that have happened around the world, we need to take a look at our Father's Word and give forth with a little supposition, prophecy. Could it be? Perhaps it is. That sort of thing. Discussion. Discussion into our Father's words and the current events of this moment. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father as we go into this. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You will all remember and know that Esau, meaning Harry, was also very red. Therefore, they called him Edom, meaning red, and his country red. We know that Esau would go north. And from the 38th chapter of that great book of Ezekiel, which we're in, that the chief, chief prince Meshech in the Hebrew is Rosh, R-O-S-H, which later became R-U-S-S, and today is Russia, of whom their president and leader has spent the last few days in this country. What does that mean biblically? Inasmuch as things historically happened as types, then we must look very closely at them for they were types of things that would transpire in the end of this earth age. This generation? I think so. So, inasmuch as God would have this man Gorbachev be probably the most influential politician of this um, generation because of his uh, charisma, he is able to mix well in most nations, a little trouble at home, but it is obvious that with his power and his ability to influence people that, and the two superpowers, the two nations of the end generation being represented by those two men, this great nation being that nation Israel, true Israel, those 10 tribes, then that has nothing to do with Judah and the land of Judea. But those tribes that went north over the Caucasus and mountains that settled Europe, later coming to this great nation. Those that do not understand prophecy do not understand the migrations of those people that have become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. So what is new under the sun? There's nothing new under the sun. It's just that the majority of people sleep. I want to go back to the birth of those two nations. It had to do with the birth of two children. God stated in Malachi as well as in the book of Acts chapter 9, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, even while he was in the mother's womb. You'll find that written in both Malachi chapter 1 and Acts 9. Anytime I make that statement, it seems that some cannot believe that God would hate a little pink baby. He didn't hate the little pink flesh. It was the soul that he placed in the flesh. All souls come from God. So, needless to say, God was displeased because his heritage meant nothing to him. And that would be the equivalent of you working for a child, doing your very best, and them spitting in your face, or throwing it right back in your face and say, I don't need you. I don't need your heritage. Don't want anything to do with it. I'll trade it for a bowl of mush. Okay, with that thought in mind, I want to... Want to, to draw attention to your mind again, the birth of these two boys. Uh, Rebecca was barren. She could not conceive. And we pick it up then in chapter 25 of the book of Genesis. As it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the ending. ending. There is nothing new under the sun. Verse 21 of that chapter. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But even at this conception, as those two matured in her womb, do you know what happened? They were still sparring. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, 
If it be so, why am I thus? Why is this happening in my womb? And she went to inquire of the Lord. You know, it might not hurt you that when man can't answer your questions, remember, take it to the Father. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations. Now it doesn't say two peoples. Oh, it could be translated that way, but it's translated properly. Two nations. Today, the two superpowers of the end times. Two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people. One very red and the other fair shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. Make it known in your mind that God knew beforehand that the younger Jacob would be the blessed. The covert activity brought forth by Rebekah and the very son himself, uh, Jacob, was simply carrying out God's orders. Uh, verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, two nations. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau, which Esau means hairy. All right? And they um, called his name Esau, and after that, verse 26, after that, came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, that's heel grabber or supplanter, taking the place of, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Threescore, sixty years old, and the two twins are born. Twenty-seven, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man. Uh, plain in the Hebrew, this word better would translate upright or pure. Dwelling in tents. Verse 28. And Isaac loved Esau. Why? He was a good hunter. Brought in fresh venison. Well, let's read on. Because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. 29. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. He was starving to death. He hadn't found any game that day. Verse 30. In other words, you must put this in your mind. Jacob planned well, provided food, stored it, where Esau was simply a hunter by chance. When you missed the hunt, you went hungry. 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that red, some red portage. For I am faint, therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. That nation has gone as the red nation for years, years, especially since that day in 1917 when the Tsar, the true king of Russia, was murdered along with his family as it is written of in the Minor Prophets. Verse 31, And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. The supplanter is at work. Remember, that birthright is what the father had provided for Esau. He disrespected it. In the following verse, 32, And Esau said, Behold, I, I am at the point to die. I'm starving to death. He's listening to his gut. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? I'm going to die anyway if I don't have something to eat. What good is it to me? 33, And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. The entire birthright passed off to the younger as God had prophesied um, in that uh, 23rd verse, in the, uh, that the younger, the elder would serve the younger. 34, then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage for lent of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He hated it. That's why God was not happy with him for one thing. He did not care about his father. How do you treat your own children when they throw your, their birthright in your face? Take your name and hack it. All right? Have you ever had that happen to you? That's what Esau did to Almighty God. Now, unfortunately, there were blessings placed upon these two. And I would ask you what is new under the sun. When Esau comes to Jacob in this superpower meeting, when they come to talk on great things, this summit meeting, 
What is the main thing that Esau wants? That is to say, Gorbachev. With the red mark for anyone that doesn't, that cannot be aware of God's word, he places a visible sign for the stupid so that they can see he is red to represent that one that came out red. I'm not knocking him. I'm saying God's prophecy is a beautiful thing. He did not care that much, though concern for weaponry and uh, agreements on disarmament and so forth. But his main concern was what? Wheat, trade agreement, food, pottage. What is new under the sun? There is nothing new under the sun. The two nations are still in that place of the two brothers. One, missing out on the hunt and needing food very badly. We're going to cross right. We're going to, for the sake of time, let's go to the 27th chapter. Let's look at the blessings. You know the covert activity in which Rebecca and um, uh, Jacob brought forth to steal the birthright, such as putting a hairy goat skin on his arm that Isaac would think that Jacob was Esau and bless him with the true blessing. What was that blessing? Let's read of it in the 28th verse of the 27th chapter. Chapter 27, verse 28. The blessing gave, given to Jacob. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. In other words, your land will always produce. The land will produce for you. And so it has been for Jacob, this great nation, producing so much food that our very farmers, the lifeblood of the nation, are criticized. Not necessarily, well, criticized. I'll let that stand. Probably a poor choice of terminology, but let it be. And penalized because of the gift of God and the blessings upon this great nation with its waving fields of pottage, that is to say, grain. The word of is used here in the sense that it is a partitive preposition. Partitive being an adjective, but it is a preposition in as much as. Partitive means to parcel out or to part out or to give or to bless. It's important that you note that. Now, I want to skip on, if I may, to the 38th verse of this same chapter. Esau comes in. Jacob has the blessings. And Esau begins to weep, cry, because his birthright, which he sold, was still given. He didn't intend to give it up. You know, he's, that's the kind of person he was, and that's the kind of person he is. There's nothing new under the sun. He shall not change. What was the blessing given him? It was a curse. Let's read it in the 39th verse. I think I said the 38th, but I meant the 39th verse of the same 27th chapter. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, listen carefully, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And you see, that sounds well and good. It would seem they both received the same blessing, but that's an impossibility. And then the truth in the Hebrew manuscripts come forth that the of here is a privative. The preposition is privative, which means it, uh, it uh, causes privation or to be deprived of. In other words, it's a curse. In other words, you will not have the fatness of the earth, nor will you have the dew from heaven, that dew being the pure water, the latter rain, the early rain, the truth of God's word. And in that great Russian nation, the church is nailed shut after 1917, and the country trying to defoliate itself of the spiritual uh, significance of our Heavenly Father and the presence of that Holy Spirit. How could it receive the blessings of God when it abhors God? I'm not talking about the Russian people that are Christian. They pay a greater price for being Christian than some of you couch potatoes in this great nation. I'm not insulting anybody. I'm just saying don't talk about a people until you've worn their moxins three days. The privative, the from, means away from. 
you're going to be away from the fatness. So what is new under the sun, and why should Gorbachev, Esau, not come with his empty bowl, saying, fill it? His people, not necessarily hungry, they have some of the basics, but what is this situation of this prophecy, and how does it fit, and how does it apply to this hour, to this generation? I want you to consider the fatness of the land. If we were to take the southernmost part of Russia, let us say in this great nation, we go to Florida in the wintertime, some do, I, I rarely get a chance to, not to vacation, maybe on business, in the wintertime, uh, it's quite a thing to go from Minnesota to, or to the northernmost places in the wintertime. But you see, the southernmost place of Esau's land is along the Canadian border. It would be, you know, the I'm just speaking in generalities. Most of it would be above the 50th parallel, which would put it at the border of Canada. Canada is a blessed nation, but they cannot produce the things that we can here all year round or the summer to reach the full fatness, though they do have the blessings of God. Thank God for that. And they are very prosperous because of their system, their system under God, not with God defoliated from the very system itself. So how can they be blessed? And you see this prophecy come to pass that the very geographical location itself removes them from the fat of the land. That is to say, land that can produce the better food as this great nation, America, and many other Christian nations in the Americas, even as well as Europe. They're removed from it. They don't have a prayer as far as having plenty every year. They might luck out and get a good year occasionally, but basically they're going to miss. So, what is new under the sun? It is exciting when you live in that generation in which your father's word comes to pass. His prophecies fulfilled or you see those events transpiring, and you that understand God's Word say, I understand there is nothing new under the sun. Esau comes again with his bowl. As we move into this one world system, it is well and good, for it is God's plan. It is that I wish you to understand, though, in relationship to our Father's Word. I want to go to the Minor Prophets for a moment. I want to go to Obadiah. Again, where, uh, where Esau, where Jacob are mentioned. We're only going to cover that particular part that belongs to Esau because of the events that are taking place. I want to read from Obadiah, and I want you to listen to prophecy and I want you to look around you today, get your head out of the sand, and observe what is happening in this world. Not this nation, or this hemisphere only, but the world. Listen to it. Obadiah in the Hebrew tongue, meaning servant of God. Are you? Are you a servant of God? Do you understand your father's word? Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. This is what I have to say concerning Russia. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us raise, rise up against her in battle. Two, behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Last, superpower, yeah, thou art greatly despised. In other words, among the heathen themselves, they hate you, Edom. You're not really the superpower that you claim to be. Not with an empty bowl you're not, friend. Verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. You put out a lot of propaganda and deceived yourself, thou that dwellest in the cliffs of the rock. This brings the Kenite leadership in with it. Whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? He has driven God away. God shall bring him to the ground, as you will find in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. And it shall come to pass as it is written. There is nothing new under the sun, and there should be no surprises to Christians that are true Christians. Verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though you try to make like 
that great nation that is represented by the eagle. And though thy set thy nest among the stars, though you claim to have something supernatural as far as the power of force is concerned, thence, I, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You're going to have a hard fall. Five, if thieves come to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? How are you robbed, in other words? Robbers only take all they can carry and they leave. But listen, would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some grapes for the gleaning? Six, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are the things of Russia searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? He stripped bare. That's what it's saying. You look like you've been picked like a, a um, well, whatever. Picked like a chicken. It's been run through a feather plucker. All right? You've been plucked good, in other words. You don't have any feathers left. Your bowl is empty. Your economy is at the bottom. Seven, all the men of thy confederacy. What is this confederacy? The Warsaw Pact. All thy men, all the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. Back to your own border. Russia went to the, the Berlin Wall. What happened to the Berlin Wall? Down it went. East Germany, Poland, Romania, Lithuania now trying. Their confederacies of the Warsaw Pact are abandoning ship and leaving him back to his own borders. Is there anything new under the sun? Not that is not written or pro prophesied of, of our Father. And as it is written, so it shall come to pass. What makes it exciting is that you are there. You're living in that generation. You are witnessing these things come to pass. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee. And prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. They've abandoned ship. There is none understanding in him. Inasmuch as all wisdom comes from God, how could there be any understanding? For they have attempted or have tried or thought that they had driven God out. How could there be wisdom when a simple Christian without any input as far as secret data or the hidden things of Russia, their intelligence gathering systems, a true Christian needs not that information to know that these things would come to pass, that Russia's confederates would leave him, would eat his bread, take of his money. How much money does, has Russia poured into Nicaragua? To, to our hurt, train load, ship load after ship load after ship load of armaments, material. And now Nicaragua has abandoned him for the moment with an election giving a democratic leader. How, many, how much money does their confederate um, Castro take from Russia Four millions, how many million a day? And that courtship is shaky even at this point. No, Esau brings his bowl. His confederacy is falling apart or has fallen to a large part. How many two years ago, three years ago, would have ever dreamed that Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany would fall away from Russia and declare their independence. And you have only seen the start. God's Word declared it. 500 B.C., 2,500 years ago. My friend, where have you been? Verse 8. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? 
Do you think I'm not going to make them stupid? In other words, without God's presence, God's main point is not to destroy them, but to let the peasantry, the citizen, know. That's a compliment, incidentally. Know that he is God, and so it shall be. And thy mighty men, O Teman, this is South Russia, Southern Russia, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter, slaughter by deception, by starvation, and by the very system itself. Why? Verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Even as our brother, the brother Jacob, was split in two and asunder, and the Berlin Wall was built, and when one Christian tried to escape, whereby they could at least have the freedom to worship, they were cut down like dogs. You say, well, that was yesterday. It was a short yesterday. Do you think for one moment that the hearts of men change so rapidly at the leadership? Be cautious, my friend. Be very careful. The only reason events are transpiring as they are is that the left and the communist system has moved our left so far left that the liberals themselves oftentimes are past the point of what even Russia itself calls democracy. And even short hours ago, our past President Reagan, President Reagan, was asked to make an appeal to the conservatives to understand what Gorbachev was doing. I would make an appeal to you. Pay attention to what God is doing. And you will always have the victory. Eleven. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. You don't care much about your twin brother. 12. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah, now the house of Judah. In the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You say, well, that part of that, a lot of large part of that's history. No, it's only a type. The history was only a type for the actuality. Wake up, Judah. It's late. I would say something else to Judah. Get off your brother Jacob's back. A word to the wise is sufficient. 13. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. The giveaway of all things. Rip-off artist in the very treasure itself. 14, and I'm talking about more than Russia now when I talk of rip-off artists in the treasury. 14, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. The Berlin Wall should never have been built. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress, nor should you have shot them down like dogs, like cattle, as Christians tried to escape whereby they could have dignity in their sacred, divine destiny. Oh, are you happy today that we're all seeking democracy? Take a close look at the democracy. Be happy in it in as much as it is God's plan. But don't be a fool. God does not suffer fools gladly. It is written and it comes to pass exactly as it is written. Therefore, be warned and take counsel from your father and be on guard. For Esau and Jacob, 
still have some rough days ahead. 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. The day of the Lord is the time the heathen know he is God. Otherwise, they are taught he is not God. There is no God. They're going to find out there is a God and he is writing their own history here in the Word, in the pages of time. Long ago, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. It's a little late, but it's going to befall that system. The deterioration of the Confederacy shall continue. There shall be straws handed out, for the bowl is now a quarter full or maybe the bottom covered, not filled, or you're not paying attention. Some newscasters would have you think that the president filled the bowl. There are strings attached. Don't kid yourself. And don't listen to liberal newsmen that must, that must decipher because you're too stupid to know, they say, what that the presidents declare. They've got to decipher it for you so that it comes out as the controllers would have you understand the international media at this time that works for the prince of darkness uh, and are controlled by the prince of darkness, which is to say the Kenites. Don't be stupid. Wake up. And for as ye have drunk unto my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. It's all for nothing. All for nothing. The following verses following that have to do with the restoration of true Israel, and she shall be restored. Why? Because God is in control because we have God on our side. I would not think that would be too difficult to figure out when they have defoliated their people of being able to think of God and praise God again for those Russian people and the peoples in the Russias that still maintain their faith in the living God. What precious, how much they must please our Heavenly Father. Why have I brought this to you for current events and our Father's Word lock hand in hand? Our Father's Word is tomorrow's newspaper. His true commentators are His chosen pastors and spokespeople that speak for Him through that Word with the gift of pastorship. Do you recognize a pastor when you see one? Do not take his word, else it align with the word of the living God. But his credentials will be his or her ability to teach. Those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, recognize those credentials as they fall. We are living in some very exciting times. It thrills my heart to see the prophecies unfold before our very eyes, whereby you say, Father, I love you for having shared this with us to tell us of those events that shall be and to have chosen us to live in this generation when these things transpire. Obadiah, Hebrew tongue, servant of Yahweh, servant of the living God. Are you? I would really seriously think about becoming a servant of the living God. It's real simple. He's your father. I don't care who you are or of what race, nationality, or whatever. He is the father of all souls. Let him know today that you love him and seek his truth from his word and be informed. Have peace of mind when the crazy world runs roughshod and wild. But it aligns with your Father's plan exactly on line, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. As our Father has told us, it shall be. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, please. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Adults need to have it, but you'll find it in our, our bookstore, okay, that you can order it from here. Fantastic work. Uh, Nancy from New Mexico, what distinguishes a truly discerning Christian from a judgmental one or a, de a deceiving Christian from a hyper uh, critical person. It may seem to be splitting hairs rather than clarifying until one finds oneself out on the front lines trying to see past the smoke screens. Well, it, it's really quite easy. That's why we're fishermen for men. And you fish for men the same way that you would for fish. Well, how do you fish for fish? Well, you don't throw anchors at them. You don't set off sticks of dynamite. You throw out something that's tempting. And if they take the bait, you pull them in. If they don't take the bait, you let them go. God did not assign anyone to be the savior of the world aside from Christ himself. So in planting seeds, only God can make them grow. Man cannot. So it's really quite simple. A discerning person simply plants a seed when it's obvious God would want you to and, and drop it right there. That's all you do. Plant the one seed and walk away. It, it would seem that some people want to let that ignorant person know everything you know and you just dump the whole thing on them and they're going to run from you. You're wasting your time. And so true discernment is to fish for men. If they take the bait, then continue. If they don't, end of, end of story. God knows how to save people. He just uses us to assist. Yogesh from Georgia <clears throat> Why would there be giving and taking in marriage as in the days of Noah prior to the appearance of the false Christ since the birth of Christ had already occurred? Why would the fallen angels want to commit these? They're, they're crude. Have you never read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, where Paul tells a woman to keep her Christ over her head? It says covered. A lot of people think that means a hat or a veil. I'm not talking about that. It's talking about keep Christ over her head because of what? Verse 10, because of the angels. They're coming back. And uh, that's where they left their first habitation was to seduce women. They're going to be doing the same thing again. That's what Christ said in Matthew 24. Uh, Leaguer from Louisiana. My question is Lucifer Satan being one of the stars. <clears throat> well, the, the word, you know, Satan is a copyist. This is why Christ is Christ and he is Antichrist. He wants to be Christ. Christ is the morning star. He calls himself the morning star. Okay. He copies everything pretending to be Christ, and it's going to deceive a lot of people. The name Lucifer in the Hebrew tongue, means bright star. And if you read the 38th chapter of the great book of Job, all of God's children in the first earth age were called stars. Okay? I mean, they were God's children. Okay? Each one in his own way. That's not to say they were literally stars. 
but they were children of God called that. And naturally, the leader of those children would be the morning star. That's the first, first light. Christ is our first light, certainly not Satan. Satan is a copyist. Velma from New Jersey, Pastor Murray, in Genesis, when Eve took the fruit from the tree, was it an apple? Have you ever read the Bible? No way. It doesn't say she took an apple. That's taught in Sunday schools, misleading little children. They were in a fig grove, so naturally they couldn't have taken an apple. Well, how do you know they were in a fig grove? What did they cover themselves with? wasn't apple leaves, it was fig leaves. Therefore, even to this day, what is the fig leaf symbolic of? Hidden ones. <clears throat> and did they cover their mouth where they'd eaten an apple? No, they covered their private parts where the very act of Satan, as it is written by Jesus Christ in teaching Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 36, down to telling who the tares are and what they did to women. Uh, Pastor Murray, this is Sim from Florida. I have a daughter that I love very much, is with a young man. He's lying and cheating and trying to play this family. I love my daughter very much. I take her to the Bible and tell her about evil spirits that Satan uses people to do his work also. She believes everything he tells her. I hope that this letter will get on your program and let her hear from a man of God about Satan's spirits. Well, I, you know, not judging, but if he does lie, that's what Satan is a liar and a thief. And he will steal the girl's life if she lets him. So if the person, a young man, if he wants to make a... a um, hit with a, a girl, young lady, then he should talk Bible. He should talk God's Word. He should never lie to her. And I'm afraid he's picked the wrong family to try to take it to play because Papa is not going to let him. He's going to tell him where the cow eat the cabbage. Ray from Illinois, be gentle in doing so. Ray from Illinois, what day of the week do you say that Jesus was crucified on? On a Wednesday. He was crucified on Wednesday and he was placed in the tomb at sundown, which that began Thursday. He was in the tomb all Thursday till Friday evening, which that begins then uh, until th Thursday evening, rather, which began Friday and then Friday evening, which begins Saturday. And then sometime in the night, he resurrected three, and a, three days plus. Uh, your companion Bible has an appendix that gives you almost hour by hour play on that. Uh, Jessica from New York. I'm 10 years old and I watch your program each morning with my parents. My question is, what is the difference between a pastor and a priest? Why can't a priest be married and pastors can't? Thank you for your program. We love it. Well, we, we would be talking, you know, some priests can marry in various religions, but there are certain religions that that they are celibate. That is that is the choice of that church. Um, it is natural that, um, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that um, it's all right for a pastor to have a family. Okay. You know, in, in Christ's times and in Paul's times, we did not have the modern convenience such as television whereby you could be at home every night and still teach all the way around the world. Uh, they would be gone from home months and months and years at a time, which made it very difficult to have a family. And um, that's why Paul would say it's better <clears throat> that you, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's better that you be like me, unmarried, but rather than burn, it's better to marry. Burn means with passion, not going to hell, okay? If you can't handle that, then you should get married, period. Elizabeth from Virginia, how do you know when a yes or wait from God rather than can you tell if God the Father is saying yes or no or wait? Thank you. 
I sure can, Elizabeth. You know, what you do, you pray a lot, and you let the Spirit give you unction, and you go with that unction. If it doesn't work out, what he was saying was no. If it does work out, and it is a blessing, then he said yes. But you always want to wait until the unction comes where you pretty well know you have the answer. But at the same time, you want to be, there's only one way things get done, and that's to get about it. Okay, so it's according to uh, whatever the situation is or whatever. God will let you know whether it's right or wrong. Ronald from California, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, the word spirit is lowercase in some Bibles, uppercase in others. Since God does not tempt us, then it must not be the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. No, um, every individual has a spirit. Okay. Christ's spirit just so happens to be the Holy Spirit okay, because it's the spirit of God. But it's still, when it is used singular, it was his own unction or spirit. You know, you have a spirit. I have a spirit. My spirit is, is um, my intellect that assists me in teaching God's Word or to convey the beautiful thoughts in the Word of God. That's my spirit. But it is, that is, the, that is the unction and the thought process of every entity. They have a spirit. That's not to take away from the Holy Spirit, but in that case, it's letting you know that Christ willingly, openly, and definitely, in as much as he showed us how to get it done, said, Satan, bring it on. I can, I can handle it. And boy, did he. Uh, Brandy from Georgia, um, I, have all, I have a question for you. The first, how do you plant seeds? And the second, if you have a learning disability, can you still be one of God's elect? Of course you can. God uses whomever he will. He chooses whomever he will. If you can see the truth and, and you know that the false Christ comes first and you're going to stand against him, it isn't you that speak. It's Christ that speaks through you when you're delivered up. So certainly a learning disability is not going to bother you in that case as long as you know the truth and uh, stick with it. How do you plant seeds? Like I said earlier, you fish for people. You throw out the bait, and if they take it, you reel them in. If they don't, it's over. Uh, James from California, what side of the gulf will I go on? Well, uh, James, I'm sorry, I don't know your actions. How, how could I judge that? You're the one that must judge that. Whatever you do determines which side you go on. If you love the Lord God, if you believe upon his son, you're going to go to the, and you try to serve him. That is to say, plant a seed occasionally and so forth. And you study the good word. You're going to be on the right side of the Gulf. Sue from Indiana. I heard you say something only last for five months in the millennium. Could you explain what you were talking about? Not the millennium. It's just before the millennium, as it's written in Revelation chapter 9, that Satan, and, and his name is given in both the Greek and the Hebrew, so you couldn't, you couldn't go wrong. He made it so definite as to who he was talking about that um, Apollyon and Abobdon, the destroyer, Satan, will only have five months to deceive the people when God's elect are delivered up before him. Only five months. And at the end of that five months begins the millennium. Uh, Roy from Colorado. A question. I struggle with the idea that we should love everyone unconditionally which I hear a lot of people saying, church and religious people. It seems God loves us if we believe that. That's not true. You know, 
you, we love everybody unconditionally. However, there comes into that tough love. If you truly love your enemy, let, let's take the teachings of God. Always let that override everything. God said, if you love your child, you're not going to spare the rod. You're going to correct him. Okay. You can read of that even in Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament. The God corrects you if he loves you. And it's the same way. If you love your enemy, you're going to give him an attitude adjustment. And it may take a two before. It may take however big of toys he likes to play with. Okay, That's the way you judge it. And that's called tough love. But most of all, we don't let Satan's very choice destroy our people. <clears throat> we dispatch them. We have a great herd in this nation at this time that we are allowing terrorists to practically destroy a whole plane load of our people and then let some judge say, whether do you plead guilty or not guilty instead of turning him over to the CIA and putting him on a waterboard and find out where he came from, who he's doing business with, and how to handle it militarily. It's not a judicial situation. And this country is going to lose this war if this continues. You can't read the enemy the Miranda, their Miranda rights because they're not American citizens. They want to kill us. So if you love them, you have to act and react accordingly. You know, if you are sick and you got a joint out of place, you go to a chiropractor. If you have an appendix about to rupture, you go to a surgeon. If you have a terrorist that's a trying to destroy innocent civilians, the first duty of our government is to protect the citizens of this nation. And that's why we have an army. That's why we have the Marines. That's why we have the CIA, Air Force. We have all kinds of tools to use against to win the war rather than to let a bunch of slick lawyers play court when they are so ignorant when it comes to handling a situation like that that we're going to lose if it continues on. The terrorists laugh at us when we do not take appropriate measures to find out who they're connected with and get to it. And I know that some will say, well, I've never heard a preacher talk like that. Well, you have now. And I'm a very patriotic American. I'm an old combat Marine. I know how to take care of business. Been there, done that. And I hate to see this nation lose everything it's got because of some slick lawyers trying to play uh, CIA. They haven't got it. They're too ignorant. It is not that they are ignorant. It's just that's out of their line of work. They do not know what they're dealing with, period. Okay, enough said. Okay, I have a question, and who is this? This is uh, Juliet from Arizona. I have a question, Zechariah 5, 9, the two women who, what indicates the two women? Pray for me and my family. You've got that, and... The two women take the ephah for basket that old sister Babylon's sitting in and take her up and play between heaven and earth and try to get people to worship her. They are, the two women are as stark, and a stark is a very unclean bird. Okay, that, that answers your question. Brad from Tennessee. Explain to me the fig tree and do you believe that Israel, when it became a state and given to be a named state in the, I think it was 1947. Does this mean that all generations born after this were named a state? Well, it, it, has, it has to do with the generation of the fig tree, and that's the final generation. That's, that's what it means. Uh, study the parable of the fig tree. Uh, Donna from California, my question, is the fallen angels who left their habitation to seduce the daughters of Adam did these angels have male sex organs and the ability to produce sperm? 
What, what was Adam created in the image of? God and the angels. And um, was Adam able to uh, uh, produce? Because it's the exact image. And the answer is, of course, yes, they did have. They're not flesh, but we are made in the exact out of flesh material that they are in heavenly material, spiritual material. And here's another one from this same Donna. My question is, how many of Noah's wives were, went on the ark with him? If it was only one, was Ham's, bio, was, yes, it was Ham's biological mother because Noah only had one wife. Okay. And I got another one from this Donna. My question pertains to the six-day creation. Did God make one male, one female of every race? Of course he did. Okay, that's why we have our races with them. God created them on the sixth day and he looked and it was good. God is proud of the races. He loves them. Uh, Brenda from California. I have heard that fear is an evil spirit. To be afraid is to call the Lord a liar because he will not leave you alone to do this battle. The Lord is always with us. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But fear is not an evil spirit. I want you to make a home assignment, Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. Start reading there and know that God gives you power over all your enemies. In Christ's name, use it. Being out of time, I must say to you, I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. You make His day, guess what? He's going to make yours. Brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, Bless God again. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. Listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.